Hi, Ben Johnson here to record this week's High Tech Friday. This week we take a look at the second half of the top 14 skills that each every teacher should know about Excel. We left off at uh, number 9, Spark Lines. We'll uh, cover auto sum, absolute versus relative formulas, um, if and or functions, vertical lookup, and then briefly how to record a macro for uh, jobs that you repeat or complex jobs that you need other people to do that may not have the Excel skills. So let's start with um, spark lines. Go ahead and open up a spreadsheet with some data. Um, ho hopefully you've got um, at least uh, three data points. In this case I've got price one, two, and three. Um, just by looking at these raw numbers it's hard for me to tell whether the prices are going up or down or staying the same. Um, our brains just don't work, work that way, but um, if we see a picture we can quickly identify which which of the movies is going up, which is going down, so on. And the way we accomplish that is with a uh, spark line. And so to uh, get started with the spark line, you just uh, click in the cell to the right of the data usually, although you can do it anywhere. And then you go to your insert menu, and uh, here in spark lines you can choose line, column, win, loss. And I just encourage you to play with those. Um, typically I'll just do a line, but um, that's not the always the right option. Then you select the data that you want to create the spark line of. You tell it where you want it to go. In this case I2. Then you just hit OK. And it makes a, a nice little graph of those three data points. And so I can quickly tell without having to study the numbers that those values are going up. Now within your spark lines you've got some uh, choices. Um, one of the ones that you may frequently want to look at is this axis. Um, it will automatically adjust the um, axis for each of the spark lines to fit within the cell and so that might um, give you misleading results because um, while one student may have improved just a little and another student a lot because they auto fill the cells it may leave you with the impression that uh, both of those students improve the same amount, and so if you if you don't want that to happen, you can just change it to same for all spark lines on these um, axes, and then axes that way uh, you don't um, mislead anybody. But I'm just going to leave this the default, and uh, I'll just uh, go ahead and autofill that down. And this data is just uh, silly data that I autofilled, so my uh, spark lines aren't aren't the greatest, but I can quickly see um, this movie went up in cost, this movie declined, these movies started low, went high, and then finished low. Um, by studying the numbers it would be hard for my brain to, to figure that out. So um, if you get uh, test scores throughout the year and you just want a quick glance to see which students improved, which students did not improve, um, it's easy to accomplish that with the spark line. So that's the first tutorial. Um, let's have a look at the next one. Auto sum. Um, it's super easy. If you want to add a bunch of numbers, you just put your mouse below those numbers or to the right of those numbers. And uh, you just go to your home menu and here's the auto sum button. You just click that. Excel will guess which numbers you want to add. It usually guesses correct. And as long as it does, you just hit enter and uh, you get that nice total. So it's just a really fast way to add a bunch of numbers. Um, I think most people that use Excel are familiar and know how to use that tool, but um, just in case there are any new people out there, that's how that works. If for some reason Excel ever guessed wrong, what you can always do is just use your mouse and uh, manually highlight. So for example, if I hit my auto sum button here, um, I'm obviously not going to try to add the spark line, so I would just use my mouse and uh, re-highlight the correct numbers and then press enter. Alright, so that's auto sum. If you ever see this green triangle. It's just Excel trying to tell you, hey, um, you may have missed a number here. Um, and you can just ignore that error if you want to, because it, in fact here it wasn't, but it's just trying to be helpful. All right, so that's auto sum. All right, absolute relative uh, formulas. This one, if you don't understand, Excel can get you into trouble pretty quickly, so I just want to show you how that works. Um, let's say that we wanted to calculate um, with taxes what uh, this would be. So if I uh, type in uh, my tax rate here and I type something like 10 percent 
then I can just do um, this number times the 10 percent and so um, writing formulas in Excel you always start with equals and then you would just do this number times this number and then I would press enter and it's going to give me uh, two dollars and twenty cents uh, tax for that movie now as you've seen in the past it's usually really helpful to um, just go ahead and auto fill that down and normally it works but in this case you can see that it didn't work and if you look at the formula you can figure out quickly why it didn't work um, you can see that it took H3, the price of the second movie, but it tried to multiply it by a tax rate that it thought would be in K2. And the reason that happened is Excel just assumed that since we copied the formula down, the tax rate must also go down with it. And in this case, our tax rate always stays fixed in that cell K1. And so it's really easy to fix that. It's called an absolute formula. You can just put dollar signs in front of the uh, letter and the number. And then that's going to tell Excel, um, oops, let me click on the right one. So I just put dollar signs around the letter and the number of the uh, value that doesn't move. And that's called an absolute reference. And the reason they're dollar signs is it has nothing to do with the fact that we're working with money here. It's just uh, the syntax that Excel uses to, to write an uh, absolute formula. Now if I autofill that down, you'll notice that that in fact it, it works um, because it keeps that K1. Now another way to do this is um, by naming a cell. So I'll do tip right here and I'll do 12, 12%. Okay. And in this case I'll rewrite the formula. But what I'm going to do before I do a absolute reference with dollar signs is I can actually click on this 12% that's in cell N1 and I can come here to where it says N1 the cell address and I can just change that name to tip rate all one word and then I have to press enter so now that I've renamed that cell address to tip rate that's going to uh, treat that as a absolute reference and so I can rewrite the formula to be equals H2 times and since I renamed the cell tip rate I can just type that that name in and now if I auto fill that down you're going to see that uh, it will just hold that cell address tip rate. It won't try to change it. Excel is smart enough to know that if I've um, named a particular cell, then I probably want to make absolute references to that to that cell. So that's a second way to make an absolute reference. Now, when you make these absolute references um, or these um, name cells, you can name an individual cell, or you could name a whole group group of cells. So maybe I'm going to use this group of cells I, I could come here and rename this um, price three and then if I ever wanted to do some sort of a, a lookup or something I could always just refer to that group of numbers as price three uh, instead of having to type the uh, cell addresses so nice way to make an absolute reference and uh, sometimes it's it's faster to, to write formulas that way so those are good things to uh, to know. All right. Um, next on our list are uh, if and and or, and uh, these are incredibly powerful um, because they can kind of make your spreadsheet think for you without you being there to to babysit it. So um, maybe here I'm just going to say something like uh, I'll just start with a plain old if. And I'll say um, expense, expensive. Okay, so I've got this called expensive, and I'm just going to look at this first price. And if it's over 20, I'll say it's expensive. If it's under 20, I'll say inexpensive. So um, the way that a teacher might use this for practical purposes would be, say, you've got uh, student test scores and you need to place them in algebra one or algebra two based on their test scores. You could uh, write this if statement um, to place them into the class automatically and if you're placing thousands of students of course it's going to be a huge time saver and a lot less error so to do an if uh, function you're just going to type in equals which is how all formulas and functions start in Excel and then you type the name of the function if by the way if you don't know how to do these things just google them on YouTube and you'll find a nice uh, video that uh, teaches you all these different functions but if is 
one of my favorites. Um, it's just a nice time-saving function. So we go if, and then what we want to look at, and we'll do this first price, so we'll say if um, F2, the number in F2, is uh, greater than 20. So we just say if parentheses F2 is greater than 20, that's our first argument. It's the logical test. Then we separate the arguments with commas. If the, the value is true, we'll, we'll just say expensive. And notice I'm putting it in quotes because it's text. And then if it's false, um, which is the last argument, we'll just say inexpensive. Put that in quotes, finish off the uh, parentheses and press enter. And you can see that that movie is inexpensive. And now we can just autofill it down. And you can see that the uh, spreadsheet quickly um, labeled all these inexpensive or expensive. And it looks like my cut point wasn't great because they're mostly inexpensive. So I can always just come up here and change that value to, I don't know, maybe 17. And uh, re-autofill. All right. So that's, that's the if statement. Now, chances are um, it's, go it's going to... Uh, need to get uh, more complicated than that with uh, ands or ors and so let me just show you how how you would go ahead and write that sort of a statement maybe we want to look at um, a couple of prices maybe we'll look at the two the two prices and just say if either of those is um, say over 50 we'll say it's expensive so in this case we'll do equals if and then we'll do or so you do if princey or princey and then you do this and you'll say greater than 50 and then we put a comma and then we click on this greater than 50 then we can close that parentheses and then um, we would write expensive here if either if either of those are true if both of if if they're not if either one of those is not true then we'll just put uh, inexpensive so you can see um, very similar it just sort of adds a, another layer inside of it and because we're using the or it allows us to put several um, criteria in this first argument. Okay, and I'll press uh, enter and then I can auto fill that down and you can see that uh, once either of the movies was over 50 it went ahead and labeled them expensive. Alright, so let's do let's do an and this time and I know I'm doing this quickly but I just want to show people the possibilities so this one let's say that maybe uh, two things have to be uh, true in order for the movie to to be expensive. So again, we would just do equals if, and and we'll click on this price of this first movie. And we'll say greater than 19, and then we'll say this one is greater than 19. Again, we'll say expensive and inexpensive. We'll close that off. And so you can see that we've got both of these movies were over, these prices were both over 19 so it labeled it expensive. But you can see here these inexpensive movies, the first ones were not. And so you can use AND or logic um, to help you precisely. So if you had two test scores that you needed to look at, you can uh, use those in order to place a student in, in the proper math class. Now beyond that you can do some um, nested ifs. I'll just show you that uh, briefly. So let me uh, delete these. I'll show you how to do a nested if. Maybe you've got like uh, cheap, average, and expensive. So let's just go ahead and show you how you would do that. So you would go equals this, um, or equals if this is uh, greater than um, let's say 20. We'll we'll say that's expensive. 
now here's where we can do the uh, nesting. So now we'll go ahead and put um, another comma here, and this is where we'll nest another if statement. And then we'll say if it's um, greater than 16, then let's make it uh, average. And then we can go ahead and put our, our uh, false statement in here. And then we can say, uh, otherwise it's a, a cheap movie. And then we need to make sure that we close off all of our parentheses. So we, we end up with equals if F2 is greater than 20. That's going to label that movie expensive. Put it in quotes because it's text. And then we nest another if within here. So then we say if F2 is greater than 16, it's going to be average. And then it's just going to make all the other movies um, cheap. So hopefully I wrote that correctly, and I'll press Enter. And that's an average price movie. You can uh, autofill that down, and you can see that uh, we have um, average, expensive, and cheap. Um, you could think of that as Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Geometry, if you wanted to uh, be able to place students into uh, three different math classes. So that's a nested if. Again, I know that I'm going through these pretty quickly. You can Google these. Uh, you would search for nested if in that uh, situation. All right. Um, next, a vertical lookup, which is an awesome tool. So I'll just quickly show you that. It is not um, terribly uncommon to uh, get two tables that uh, you need to get to talk to each other. And so in fact, let's let's just create that scenario, and I'll delete rating here, and uh, I'll uh, sort sort these in some other order. So so here's a situation that you'll run into frequently. Um, you'll have two data sets um, with the same students, um, although there may be different missing students and extra students in some of the tables. In this table you'll notice that it's missing rating, but we've got it in this table. You want to populate a single table with rating. And uh, in this example it'd be easy. I could just resort these and uh, plug them in, but it's not usually that easy. So we'll just go ahead and show you how to do a VLOOKUP table to populate this uh, column back with the rating. So if you do a vertical lookup table, what you want to do first is uh, usually I'll go ahead and sort this uh, table in alphabetical order. It, it's helpful if you do that. I'll sort this one out of order just so that hopefully the simulation is maybe a little more realistic for you. All right. Then you just want to take um, your mouse and uh, highlight that table. You can do a control shift um, right and then down to get that and then you can just name this um, you can just call that that table your rating rating table all one word no spaces press enter now I can refer to this as my rating table so then I come over here to H2 to the right of, of my data and then I do my um, I can click on my FX button here or I can do uh, more more functions and what I want to do is look for the uh, V look up. So I just type that in and search for it. And here it is. Okay, And then that brings up sort of this little dialog box that helps you write the formula. So it's saying what value do you want to look up? Well, I want to look up the uh, featuring because that's the, uh, in this case, the unique identifier. Usually it's going to be something like an email address or a ID number, some unique number. So this example is not great because there could be um, lots of students with the same name. Okay, and then the table array, I call that rating table. Um, by the way, um, if I hadn't named that table, I'd have to use the dollar signs to make it an absolute reference so that as I autofill the formula down, it doesn't um, move, think the table's also moving down. So I, I usually will name my, my vertical lookup tables. Okay, um, the column index out of this table do we want the first column or the second column? Well, we want the second column so you type the number 2. And then this range lookup, if you want to force it to have an exact match you type in false which is typically what you'll you'll type here but there are some situations where 
you don't always do that, but uh, when in doubt, uh, type false there. It'll force it to have a perfect match so that it doesn't just find the closest name, the next closest name, and give it that rating. And then I'll hit OK. And so now I can autofill this down, and uh, the uh, vertical lookup table just went and found these different movies, what they were featuring, and it uh, popped in the rating. Now the reason this is problematic is because you can see that we've got uh, Peter O'Toole in here twice, and so um, it gave both of his movies a four star, and I suspect if we go and look, that's not, you can see over here it's four and three but it just picked the first one. So that, that's the reason that you don't use a uh, name as your unique identifier. Um, I'll always go ahead and use uh, a student ID, an email prefix, something that uh, is going to be unique for that, that person. Um, so in this example it would have been better I think if I had used the movie because um, the movies would have all been unique, but uh, I just wanted to show you the concept. And you will use the vertical lookup table frequently because often you'll have a, a data set from the state and then one from the local school district. They both have student ID in common, but they both have different test scores, and you want to eventually get those test scores on the same spreadsheet, and the way you accomplish that is through the vertical lookup table. So an awesome tool. All right, lastly, um, recording macros. If you ever do a job that's tedious, you can record a macro for that job, and that way, um, instead of having to do that job over and over and over again, you can just um, either click on a button or, or run that macro. And then a lot of times I'll, I'll put macros in the spreadsheets that others are gonna use when they might not necessarily have the Excel skills to do a particular job. So let's just make a scenario here where Say you've got a spreadsheet where you've got to um, separate first and last name frequently and you, you just get tired of doing that manually each time. So we can just record a macro to do that. Um, before you record the macro, it's a good idea to practice doing the steps so you don't make mistakes while you're recording, but it won't hurt anything. So I just come up here to, um, let's see, I think it's in the uh, view uh, menu. So I go to my view menu, view menu and then you can see macros here and I can record a macro and I can give it a name I can call it split split names I can give it a hotkey if I want to just press a hotkey um, and then you can store it just in this workbook which if you were going to send this for others to use um, that's what you would do or you could put it in your personal macro workbook which is going to allow you to use that that function on any spreadsheet that you open up on your computer alright um, you can give it a description Lots of times I'll number them because I end up making mistakes and I need to re-record them. Okay, and I'll hit OK. Now at this point your computer is actually recording all of your clicks and keystrokes and it's um, writing some visual basic code in the background and then um, you'll be able to replay that. So you just go through the steps. So I'll highlight column C, then I'll go to uh, data, text to columns, it's delimited with a uh, space, so I hit next. Um, I just click space here. I hit next, and then I hit finish. Um, when you do run a macro, it won't it won't run the macro without giving you these warning dialog boxes, which is good. So I'll just hit OK, and you can see that it split that up. And then maybe your macro you want to uh, rename these things so that you don't have to type those. All right, and so now that I'm done with the macro, I just go to my view menu, I go to macros, and I go stop recording. Okay, now I'm gonna undo what I just did so that um, you can see me run the macro and have it work. And this isn't a terribly powerful example, it's just kind of a silly example to show you um, how our macro works. And so now I could just go to uh, macros, um, view macros. There it is, and now I can just run it. And uh, there it went. Um, normally it will give you that warning dialog box, but uh, maybe because uh, the cells to the right were blank it didn't in this, this case. But uh, 
if you had a lot of tedious steps that you needed to do frequently on, say, a spreadsheet that you get from the state or the district, and you just get tired of doing it or somebody else isn't capable of doing it, just record a macro. Um, you can even put buttons to run those macros up on your your toolbar, or you can, if someone else was going to be running that, you could just also insert um, insert some uh, a button that says uh, sp split last names, and then you could just assign a macro to that button so that now when you send this to somebody else, whenever they need to do that particular thing, they will just hit that button and it would run that macro. Alright, and then uh, you would just save that. It's going to be a macro-enabled spreadsheet, and so if you email it to people, you just need to tell them that they'll get a warning and that they just need to accept, uh, accept that, that it doesn't have any viruses or anything in it. Okay, so uh, those are uh, 14 things that uh, I really think every teacher should know about Excel, even if you can't necessarily do them on your own. At least you should have a general awareness of what you can accomplish. Basically, Excel is going to let you do anything that would take you a long time to do manually, um, a way to accomplish it very quickly. So if you ever find yourself doing some data manipulation and it's taking forever, uh, find somebody that's good at Excel and they can probably teach you a, a much faster way to accomplish that. Thanks for watching this week's High Tech Friday.